Well, uh, Vandana ji spoke about uh, <clears throat> the politics behind traditional knowledge. And uh, what I propose to do is to talk about what this traditional knowledge is all about and uh, what, its, what its role could be in the area of two major issues, conservation of biological diversity, both the agricultural or human managed biodiversity as well as the natural biodiversity, which is going to be a very, very powerful economic factor of the future. It has already started happening now. And fortunately for us, we have got a rich biodiversity in this country, and therefore conserving this biodiversity for the economic well-being of the nation as a whole, and uh, social welfare well-being too, becomes extremely important. Now, uh, let me get straight into the presentation now. Sustainability science is a very developing area. It is not yet uh, taken its roots, not only in this country, but elsewhere in the world. And what one is talking about is trying to understand the obvious and the not so obvious linkages between different disciplines of science, natural sciences and social sciences on one side, and also the ability of the society as a whole in order to be able to involve the communities concerned in a developmental process right from the very beginning, right from the initiation of the process, right till the end point when the society is able to obtain a better quality of life for themselves. Pardon? Oh. oh, you can do that. I, I didn't realize right. that. Uh, you can start with the previous one. Oh, right here at the bottom, maybe. Right at the bottom. Why not? Okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, now this is better. And what I have tried to do is that I'm going to be talking about the rapidly developing area of sustainability science, which is uh, not yet taken good roots in the country, forget about in the world. And uh, recently there has been a very major international initiative of a ten for a 10 year period that has been started off by the International Council of Scientific Unions, and therefore linking knowledge systems is one of the very important concerns. The knowledge system that is available with the local communities on the one hand, and the textbook-based knowledge that is al already available in plenty in the scientific literature. Now, from the land use management point of view, biodiversity has a very important role to play. And traditionally, the rural communities in this country, the tribal societies in this country have always valued biodiversity and they have been the major custodians of conserving biological <coughs> diversity and using it effectively and sustainably managing that biodiversity for their own well-being. Now, this area of biodiversity as an important factor is even playing an important role in the urban societies. I have quoted one book there, right at the bottom, called The Land That Could Be. It's published by an American author, and uh, uh, he has written a book called uh, The Land That Could Be, and he is talking about creating biodiversity in the urban environment and its implications not only from the economic well-being of the people, but the social and the emotional well-being of the communities living in the urban centers. Now, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity, in an ecological sense of the term, has got a whole variety of scalar dimensions, right from the subspecific level to the species, to functional groups, ecosystems, and landscapes. So the, the viewpoint that I am going to take during the next few minutes is going to be a much larger, broader view of what biodiversity is all about. <coughs> now, I have used the word sacred 
with an inverted comma. So I am not talking, I am not here to preach religion of any kind. But what I would like to emphasize is there are, the biodiversity is socially valued. And that is why I have put it within sacred. And it extends over all scalar dimensions. Socially valued species, socially valued ecological systems, socially valued landscapes. Now, one of the reasons why biodiversity at all these scalar dimensions becomes important because the biodiversity is the storehouse for the knowledge systems in, from the point of view of land use management. We have got a lot that is available in the literature in terms of the formal knowledge and the formal knowledge based technologies in terms of land use development. The modern agricultural system is one of the extreme examples of that. But there is also a hell of a lot of material that is available with traditional societies, the rural societies, where the land use management is largely based upon the traditional wisdom and the traditional knowledge linked with it. And therefore, one of the things that we were interested in right from the very beginning, right from more than 50 years from now, before, was try to understand what this traditional knowledge is all about, and can we put some meanings into it, and can we appropriately integrate it with the formal knowledge that is available in the textbooks. And that integration becomes important, especially because of the fact, unless you are able to integrate the traditional knowledge with the formal knowledge, you cannot convert it into policy dimensions. You cannot convert it into developmental initiatives. And that is what we have tried to do all along. Now, what we have been able to, if I were to summarize what I said so far, is that the biophysical sense of the term, the ecological processes are determined by what is available in textbooks. But the way that knowledge, that the biological resources are managed are not necessarily confined to the textbook knowledge. A lot of it is embedded within the social processes that operate within a given society. And that has got implication from the point of view of determining ecosystem land use dynamics and ultimately has implications for sustainable livelihood and development of the societies. Now, let me give a few examples to illustrate this point. When we started with working with about 500 ethnic groups in the Northeastern region, each one with their own language, customs, music, dance forms, and whatnot, what we were able to observe is that there are certain species in the natural landscape which they consider to be sacred, what I have called here as socially valued species. And those socially valued species are emphasized in all their land use practices. And they give special importance to that. And therefore, one of the questions that arose in our mind was how do, why do they do this all the time? Whether you are taking about a species like Nepalese alder, or whether you take a few of the bamboo species, which is uh, the northeastern region is extremely rich in bamboo species. There are over 35 different species of bamboos, or they always attach a sacred value, a socially important value to that certain species out of that. And one of the things that we did, I am not going to go into the details of it, but suffice to say when we did researches over a period of now almost 50 years, one of the conclusions that I've been able to arrive at that what is socially selected by the local communities in nature, from nature has got considerable implications in terms of triggering up a whole variety of socio-ecological processes. And this is what I have indicated here in the context of the northeast, in the central Himalayan region, for example, you have got the oaks. And I don't have to give you the story of the oak story. When the oaks were being cut by the tim uh, timber extractors, there was this chipko movement, hugging the tree movement. In the northeastern context, there are n number of trees of this variety, which are socially valued. And these socially valued species have got extremely important ecological significance. And the number of arrows here, I am not going to read through it, in terms of improving the water balance, improving the soil fertility, changing the nutrient cycling processes within the system, contributing to regenerating nature in the form in which the society wants it to be, 
with implications for not only agricultural system development, but also natural resource management as a whole. And that is one of the lessons that we were able to do over a period of three or four decades of research that we did in that region. Then one of the thoughts that, one of the things that we observed when we were dealing with these over 500 ethnic groups in the Northeastern region was the fact, in spite of the fact that the Northeastern region is one of the highest rich <coughs> rainfall area in the country and probably also in the world too, Chirapunji gets something like 12 meters of rainfall and in an exceptional year it can go up to 24 meters as it happened in 1974. Now, water management is a very important issue from the point of view of very traditional rural communities. And this is particularly so in the Indian context simply because of the fact that the availability of water is concentrated for three or four months during the monsoon period and the rest of the year is bone dry. And therefore that, has, that bone dry period is a very critical period. And there is a very, in, well-known volume which was published by the CSC, Center for Science and Environment, on water harvesting systems within the country, listed more than a few hundred water harvesting systems from different parts of the country and so on. But what we were, what we were interested in, what does this water do? <coughs> and when we worked over a period of time with water and water management issues, one of the things that we found was that water management has a very key, equally key important role to play. As you can see here, when you have a socially selected species, the number of arrows are very few. When you go back to this one and put it together with the socially selected species, you have got socially selected species working along with water. What you find is that the number of arrows increases, or in other words, the sustainability concerns of the society is many times more magnified because of the uh, uh, symbiotic interaction between biodiversity and water. Sorry. Now, using these two principles, that biodiversity is a power powerful tool in order to be able to address sustainable land, land management issues. And water is another very important powerful tool in order to be able to uh, ensure sustainable management of natural resources within the system. We were, while we were talking about it, we got an opportunity to develop a developmental initiative in the state of Nagaland in Northeastern region jointly with the Nagaland government at that point of time, who had a very enlightened uh, chief secretary at that uh, time, and therefore this was made possible. What we tried to do was that that is an area which is shifting agriculture affected area, slash and bone agriculture. And one of the things that has been told time and again is that these slash and bone agricultural farmers are primitive and therefore they are not amenable to any developmental initiatives. And one of the things that we were able to do on the basis of about 100 odd scientists working with me over a period of more than four or five decades was that these people have got a rich traditional knowledge and that tr rich traditional knowledge should be harvested in order to have a developmental pathway. And that is what I call there on the left extreme there called as the incremental pathway. What does this incremental pathway mean? That primarily use traditional ecological knowledge that is available with the local communities. And that traditional ecological knowledge to a certain extent standardized by scientific analysis and try to bring in modern technologies only to the minimal extent required. Or in other words, if I may put it very crudely, 90% may be traditional knowledge-based technologies integrated appropriately with the 10% are modern, uh, modern science-based agricultural technologies and building up step by step on that on, in an incremental fashion and I don't want to get into the details of it. Suffice to say for the first time in more than 200 years or 300 years of Nagaland's existence, for the first time a developmental initiative happened where all the 40 odd ethnic groups that are living in the, in the region participated directly or indirectly. The Canadians put in about seven to eight million dollars and no developmental project of that kind has ever happened 
in the past more than a couple of hundred years. That is one uh, example that I would like to ind indicate here. <coughs> that is a project which ran initially with a lot of hesitancy. They put in the money. It ran for another five years, seeing the success of the community participation where more than 300 odd uh, ethnic groups that are living in the region participated. Uh, not, not 300, about 30 to 40 ethnic groups that are living in that region participated. The Canadians went for on their own for another five year uh, project. In all, they put about eight to $10 million. The first develop land use developmental initiative of any kind or any developmental initiative of any kind that has happened for the first time in the Northeastern region. That is one example that I have to do. When we were doing that, one of the things that was thrown at me again and again by the agricultural scientists was may maybe that it works with the traditional people. They are very primitive. And I put primitive with an inverted commas. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, it might work there. But then it doesn't work in the modern situation. We have to live with um, green revolution agriculture. And we had made already a prediction in the early 1990s that the green revolution agriculture is going to collapse. And it, it didn't take more than five to seven years for the yields started coming down over a period of time. And somewhere around the mid-1990s, we got an opportunity. A group of French scientists came to us and said that we have got some European Union money. Would you like to make use of it? And at that point of time, there was a major problem which was developing in the, uh, the uh, tea-growing areas in the Western Guards. And the tea garden managers approached us saying that the tea production is going down rapidly and the quality of the tea, tea, tea bush also is declining. The, the lifespan from about 60 to 70 years has come down to 35 to 40 years in many places. And they said, can, we, can you help us with your indigenous knowledge and indigenous technologies? And at that point of time, a, French, a group of French scientists approached me and that we have got some money, would you like to make use of it? So what we did to cut that story short, we put together a team of scientists between the French scientists on one side and the Indian scientists on the other side, worked with the tea garden managers over a period of five years. And what we tried to do is bring in traditional knowledge-based technologies only to the minimal extent required in the area of sustainable soil fertility management. Or in other words, in the incremental pathway there was 90% traditional knowledge and 10% modern knowledge-based technologies. On the other extreme, we had 90% modern science-based soil fertility management and only 10% or 20% of traditional knowledge-based soil fertility management was brought in. The idea was to sort of buffer the ill effects of the modern technologies in order to make sustainable soil fertility management possible. And that technology, I don't want to get into the details of it at this point of time. Suffice to say that that technology was patented between the Indian scientists and the French scientists and the tea garden managers. And that technology now has gone right up to the Chinese shores. And that technology, incidentally, is also freely available without any cost to the the farmers who want to adapt, use, make use of that technology from the point of view of sustainable, sustainable management of their natural resources <coughs> and with as high quality of production as possible. In between, there are a whole variety of possibilities that exist. That is, while 90% traditional knowledge and 10% uh, formal knowledge based technologies or 10% of traditional technology and 90%. There are all points of, all kinds of permutations and combinations that are possible and which we have tried out on an experimental scale in some of the rural plains of the country, including Punjab and Haryana. Now, I come to the last one or two slides. I don't want to take too much time to illustrate this. Now, this is a very interesting uh, system of the Apatanis, and I have shown it n number of times at so many places, and I repeat it here again because this is a very, very unique system in a variety of different ways. It's a system where the forest that you find at the back there is managed by the local communities. And this is becoming an area of interest from the point of view of International Union of Forest Research Organizations, from the point of view of conserving 
traditional, traditionally managed forest systems for posterity so that they could be used as learning lessons from the point of view of modern forestry. That is one dimension linked with it. And the other dimension linked with it is the fact that you have got a landscape here, it's a valley system. And this is a valley system where they do not do any slash and burn agriculture for obvious reasons. They have got a wet rice cultivation system. And I don't want to get into the details of it. There is a lot of culture, a lot of dance forms, music, poetry, embed, intertwined with the land use practice of there. Time doesn't permit me to get into it. And I have got a documentary done on that. If anybody is interested, I can copy it for you. But suffice to say, at this point of time, this is an agricultural system which is as productive as modern agriculture, whether it be the Green Revolution agriculture of Haryana or Punjab, or whether it is the American agriculture or the Japanese agriculture. And yet, the entire agricultural system is managed on the basis of traditional ecological knowledge that has been accumulated by these people over centuries. There is no modern technology of any kind that is involved. No fertilizers are used. And I will give you only one example to illustrate this, or one sentence to illustrate this. The productivity is comparable to modern agriculture. But in terms of its ecological efficiency, for a unit of energy which is all internally generated, the farmer is able to get up to 50 to 80 units of energy as output. And compare this with modern agriculture, in the modern agriculture in the Punjab and Haryana, for a unit of energy, you do not get more than 0.5 unit of energy as output. Or in the modern American agriculture or Japanese agriculture, it becomes even worse. It is only 0.1 per unit of energy input. So we are trying to get such systems. There are plenty of them in the northeastern region. We are trying to get them. We are trying to coax the governmental agencies to get some of these sites converted into World Heritage sites and there are plenty of opportunities available. Then what are we talking about? In the ultimate analysis, what we are talking about, whether it be in the area of land use management, whether it be in the area of biodiversity conservation, or whatever the other kinds of sustainability issues that one is talking about. We are talking about adaptive management, and that adaptive management has to be based on very close interaction with local communities. In fact, there are a group of scientists with whom I am closely interacting at this point of time that this approach has got a very key role to play in terms of ensuring human security, not only at a local and regional level, but also at the global level. And we realized this way back about 20 years ago when we had the NEPET project, the Nagaland project going on, because for the first time, the insurgents who were living in the northeastern region, the, the Nagaland region is very famous for insurgency, and the insurgents who were operating in the forested areas, they said that these people who are working for the Nagaland project are, are our friends, and we will not touch them. And that is the human security angle that is associated with connecting knowledge systems from the point of view of creating hybrid technologies without compromising on anything, without compromising in productivity either. And I think I should stop here because I have lost the time. Thank you very much. Thank you.